Let's talk about some of the best plants to attract pollinators to your garden, including Nicotiana, or tobacco plants, which have the potential to help control parasites in beehives. Many of the food crops we grow require pollination in order to produce the fruits or seeds we want to harvest. Pollinators are an essential part of our ecosystem, and planting flowers that attract them can help ensure that they continue to thrive. Pollinators come in many forms. The most common that most people think about are bees. Bees of various types are just about everywhere that plants grow, and they've been a hot topic for quite some time when it comes to discussion about the importance of pollinators in nature and agriculture. Butterflies and hummingbirds? Those are a couple more. Beetles, moths, various flies, and even those pesky slugs are other pollinators that don't get quite as much recognition. I think we can all agree that pollinators play a critical role in the reproduction of many plant species, and without them, a lot of plants wouldn't be able to produce fruit or seeds, which would have a negative ripple effect on the entire ecosystem. One of the biggest roles that pollinators play in nature is helping to increase biodiversity in wild plant populations. Some insects have a very close relationship with a particular plant and are specialized to pollinate only that plant species. This type of pollination is called obligate mutualism, meaning that both the insect and the plant rely on each other for their survival. One of these relationships that exists is between bumblebees and blueberries. Bumblebees are important pollinators of blueberry bushes, and blueberry flowers are an important source of nectar and pollen for bumblebees. Here in Canada, some species of bumblebees are considered to be the primary pollinators of blueberries. Even in large industrial blueberry operations, the blueberry industry relies on bees for successful crop pollination. Transporting bees on trucks to pollinate blueberry fields is a very common practice in modern agriculture. The process involves placing bee colonies onto flatbed trucks and moving them to different locations to pollinate entire blueberry fields. Overall though, it's important to remember that there are many types of pollinators, and each one plays an important role in maintaining the health and diversity of ecosystems around the world. Our property here is relatively wild. We're surrounded by tens of thousands of acres of forest. Wild plants of all sorts are everywhere, and there are blooms of various types from April right through October. The area around our house here is cleared, but we've allowed much of this space to grow as naturally as possible. Our first summer here, we didn't even cut any of our lawn areas just to get an idea of what wild native plants we had growing. This also allowed us to see what invasive plants that we had growing. Ultimately, it gave us an idea of the various flowering plants that pollinators were visiting. Even though we have a very diverse population of pollinator-friendly plants here, there are a few plants that we grow specifically for attracting a wider range of different pollinators. Some of these plants also act as companion plants, or pest control to some degree, in our vegetable gardens. Some are even edible. Let's start with marigolds. Marigolds are often considered good companion plants for a vegetable garden for several reasons. Marigolds contain a chemical compound called thiophene. This can repel certain insects like aphids, whiteflies, nematodes, so planting marigolds alongside vegetable crops can help reduce the number of pests that can damage the plants, reducing the potential need for pesticides. Marigolds are known to have a beneficial effect on soil health. They produce a substance which can help to control harmful soil-borne fungi and bacteria. Marigolds are also known to attract beneficial insects like ladybugs and lacewings, which can help control pest populations by feeding on aphids and other harmful insects. Marigold plants also attract a wide variety of pollinators, including bees, butterflies, and hoverflies. They also add a little bit of color to a vegetable garden that can be otherwise just a sea of green before things start to ripen up. And as a big bonus, the flowers are edible. The petals make a nice colorful addition to your fresh summer salads during the growing season. Do note though that some varieties of marigold are not edible. I'll leave a list of the most common edible varieties in the description here. Also, if you're buying marigolds from a greenhouse or commercial nursery, understand that they may have been treated with pesticides or fungicides that may render those started plants inedible, or at least something that you probably wouldn't want to eat anyways. Another one we really like to plant is nasturtium. We plant these for most of the same reasons as the marigolds, but they do have the added benefit of being a nitrogen fixer. Nasturtiums are members of the legume family, which means they have the ability to fix nitrogen into the soil. This can benefit your food crops, with nitrogen being an essential nutrient for plant growth. Nasturtiums also attract beneficial insects like ladybugs and bees, which help with pollination and control of other harmful insects. 
And again, this plant is edible. Both the leaves and flowers can be tossed into salads to add some color and a bit of peppery tastiness to your fresh summer salads. Keep in mind what I mentioned earlier though about nurseries and greenhouse plants. Then there is the tobacco we plant. That's right, we grow quite a bit of tobacco plants here specifically to benefit pollinators. And in particular, bees. You might even be growing some tobacco plants without really knowing it as it's a relatively common bedding plant sold in nurseries and greenhouses, often under different botanical names though that you might not necessarily recognize as being tobacco. All Nicotiana plants are part of the tobacco family. Nicotiana tobaccum is the species that is commonly cultivated for tobacco products, but there are many other species of Nicotiana that are grown as ornamental plants for their beautiful flowers. These ornamental species are not typically used for tobacco production. All Nicotiana plants contain nicotine, which is a naturally occurring chemical compound found in the plant. Nicotine is produced by the plant as kind of a natural defense mechanism against herbivores and insects, similar to THC production in cannabis. In some species of Nicotiana, the nicotine content can be quite high while in others it's quite a bit lower. It's worth noting that nicotine is a toxic substance and can be harmful to humans and animals if ingested in large quantities. But then, so are green potatoes, potato leaves, tomato leaves, rhubarb leaves, raw lima beans, and so on. The primary Nicotiana plant that we grow here is known as Nicotiana rustica. Our seeds were originally gifted to us from a friend. These are a traditional ancient seed that has been grown by First Nation folks all over Turtle Island for thousands of years. This variety of the plant could be grown in temperate climates relatively easily and was likely the earliest form of agriculture in North America, even before food crops like beans, corn, squash were grown. I won't delve too deep into this plant, but its history with humans is a tremendous example of understanding the importance of caring for the land and living in harmony with nature. There is a very unique relationship between Nicotiana plants and bees, and many species within this genus are known to attract bees with their flowers. The flowers of Nicotiana plants produce nectar, which is a sugary substance that serves as a food source for bees. The nectar is located deep within the flower, which re requires the bee to fully enter the flower in order to access it. In the process, the bee brushes against the reproductive structures of the flower, allowing for pollination to occur. The relationship between Nicotiana plants and bees is looked at as mutualistic, as the bee receives a valuable food source, while the plant benefits from the pollination services provided by the bee. Additionally, some species of Nicotiana plants have evolved to produce specific types of nectar that are especially attractive to certain species of bees. Some studies have suggested that certain compounds found naturally in Nicotiana plant nectar may even have the potential to reduce infection levels of a common bumblebee parasite by up to 81%. The researchers exposed bumblebees to nectar containing different concentrations of this compound and monitored their infection levels with the parasite. They found that exposure to nectar containing certain concentrations of these compounds resulted in a significant reduction in parasite infection levels. The study suggests that these compounds found naturally in the nectar may have potential as a natural defense mechanism against parasites in bumblebee colonies. Further studies are needed to determine the effects of these compounds on other bee species and to evaluate their potential impact on bee health and bee behavior. I'll link to a few of these studies down in the description if you'd like to delve a little further into this interesting relationship between bees and Nicotiana plants. One thing is for certain, bees have been visiting Nicotiana plants for their nectar and in turn pollinating the plants for millennia. Overall, the relationship between Nicotiana plants and bees is an important example of the intricate connections that exist between plants and pollinators in the natural world. So whether you have a small balcony or a large backyard, giant garden, consider planting a few of these plants to create a welcoming habitat for various pollinators and support the biodiversity of our planet.